In this module, we will try and discuss a disease that is really commonplace among most of the patients uh, which we see in the IOPD, that is cataract. According to its definition, cataract is an opacity in the lens or its capsule, either congenital or acquired. Cataract is by and large a progressive disease and in case the opacity in the lens is fixed or it is non-progressive, it is called as a lenticular opacity. There are certain types of cataracts. The most common which we see in practice are basically the senile cataracts. These cataracts develop after a certain age and are a byproduct of protein denaturation over a period of time. If these cataracts come on before the time or before the, uh, uh, say, the age of 40 years, which is considered now, they are called as pre-senile cataracts. These pre-senile cataracts uh, have different etiologies, uh, like a cataract in diabetes, the cataract of myotonic dystrophy, where there are syndromic associations with other diseases, and cataracts with atopic dermatitis, which form the typical shield cataracts. There are certain drugs that can produce cataracts at an early age. So, uh, the most common place among them are the steroids. Steroids in any form or in any route are most notorious to cause lenticular opacities and cataracts before their age. Among others, there are dusulfan, gold, amiodarone, and myotic drugs which are used for treatment of glaucoma. Secondary cataracts is a separate class which needs a separate mention because these are secondary to any other intraocular pathology rather than the drug induced and a pre senile which can be a part of a systemic disease. Secondary cataracts, the commonest ones being those associated with iridocyclitis where the inflammatory process in the eye can lead to formation of an early cataract. In, in this particular slide, we will look at the typical morphology of the different types of cataracts. If you look here very closely, the human adult lens is a biconvex structure with the posterior surface getting more convex than the anterior as the age progresses. It has three parts morphologically, the capsule, the cortex and the endonucleus. There are certain cataracts which are predisposed in certain regions. The cataracts that are most common, they are most common, they occur as a mixture of all these three components. The cataracts that form in the region of the nucleus, these are called as nuclear cataracts and these cataracts have a tendency to produce a lenticular myopia. This is the common reason why in the initial days these led to an improvement in vision as the age progressed but in actual, it was just the improvement in the near vision and the loss of presbyopic glasses because of the onset of lenticular myopia. The second type of cataracts are cortical spoke-like opacities. These can, uh, these can develop in, in all the types of cataracts in combination. And the third one are the posterior subcapsular, which are the common ones seen in cases of uveitis, iridocyclitis and myopia. Now if you see on the slide, the first slide shows us a nuclear cataract. If you can see there is a yellow core. This optically clear lens gives rise to initially a whitish yellow, a yellow and subsequently brown hue. The more yellow tinge that is imparted to the lens indicates the hardness of the cataract. The, second, the cataract in the second slide is classically seen. You can see cortical spokes coming from the periphery to the center. Here in the initial stages the central vision is spared and hence these cataracts and by and large noticed on routine clinical examination. The third class of cataracts, however, is the classical posterior subcapsular cataracts. These are cataracts which are opacities like a plaque. These are very close to the nodal point of the eye and especially cause increased visual symptoms disproportionate to their size because of their location within the lens. The nearer the opacity is to the nodal point of the eye, more the visual disturbance and these cataracts usually during the time of pupillary constriction, that is during bright light or during reading cause a drastic drop in visual acuity. On the right and lower side of the screen, this is an entirely white cataract where there is no element of clear cortex as is available here and this cataract is a mature cataract. These cataracts can go into two outcomes. One is the hypermature cataract where this entire cortex will liquefy and the nucle endonucleus will float down into the lens capsule that is called as the Morgagnian type or it can lose water and shrink and shrivel into a mass called as a sclerotic cataract. The treatment of cataract essentially is surgical. Cataracts have no pharmacotherapy. Surgical treatment of cataracts involve certain important steps. The most important steps are the preoperative evaluation that involve number one, 
is to establish whether the cataract is a primary or cataract is secondary to some intraocular pathology, in which case we need to take certain precautions. If it is considered to be a senile cataract on clinical examination, in that case we would proceed with the lens power calculations since after removing the lens, we need to implant an intraocular lens into the eye. So, the surgery essentially involves making an incision into the capsule, scooping out the entire contents by various methods which will be described henceforth, leaving the capsular bag behind. Hence, it is called as extracapsular cataract extraction. Extracapsular indicates not outside the capsule, but leaving the capsule behind and removing all the other contents. Now, this can be achieved essentially by three techniques, all of which come under the common heading of extracapsular surgery. It is extracapsular extraction with limbal sutures, small incision, manual cataract surgery, and phagoemulsification, which also is a small incision procedure, but it uses an ultrasonic ultrasound machine called the phagoemulsifier in the traditional ultrasound. Whereas, it, there is a new generation of surgeries coming up called as a femtosecond assisted cataract surgery. This uses the femtosecond laser to construct the incisions, make the capsulotomy opening, debulk the nucleus, only the lens removal is done by the conventional ultrasonic phacoemulsifier machine. So, coming back to the preoperative investigations, for the IOL power calculation, we need to do the keratometry, the axial length measurements and incorporate these two into IOL power calculating formulae. These formulae are essentially mathematically derived regression formulae which can be applied to all the values that we have obtained and an intraocular lens power can be hence calculated. Having said that, what are the options that are available for us today? The ideal IOL for the patient will be an IOL which will suit the needs of the patient. It all depends upon the biometric measurements that is the keratometry if the patient is supposed uh, is found to have a keratometry which is suggestive of a corneal astigmatism, currently a class of IOLs called toric IOLs are available to correct that astigmatism. The other class of IOLs are the conventional spherical IOLs, the aspheric IOLs, and the multifocal IOLs. The multifocal IOLs that are available recently are the IOLs which follow the diffractive principle. And those will give you a good amount of distance, intermediate and near vision at the expense of contrast. So, coming to the modalities of cataract surgery, we have three as we have seen. And one is extracapsular surgery with lumen sutures, manual small incision surgery and phaco. Out of these three, the essential difference is only the size of the incision. The ECC with lumen sutures has a big lumen incision around 120 degrees of an arc. The small incision cataract surgery, the incision is usually a curvilinear incision that is a scratch incision on the sclera which is of partial thickness. It can range anywhere around 3 to 5 millimeters or even more depending upon the choice or the comfort of the surgeon. Essentially in this case, the entire nucleus or the endonucleus is de delivered out of the eye in one piece. Some modifications of this technique are called as manual phaco section. Use devices that can split the nucleus manually and remove it piecemeal out of the eye. So, this can help us further reducing the size of this incision, but since these manipulations are done in the anterior chamber of the eye, there is chance of damage to the corneal endothelium. The procedure that has stood the test of time for the last two decades is phacoemulsification. Phacoemulsification essentially involves at least two small incision, one around 2.8 to 3 millimeters and one incision barely 1 millimeter to remove the entire nucleus in form of fragments. These fragments are made with the help of a phacoemulsifying probe and a second instrument. These instruments, can, uh, these uh, fragments can be individually delivered one at a time by making them into smaller pieces and aspirating them through the phaco probe. So, essential difference in these techniques is the incision size and the use of the phaco emulsifier as in the last case. Steps of cataract surgery are essentially the same for all, the, the main difference being the incision size. So, we start with the anesthesia, the type of anesthesia is either local or topical anesthesia. 
in patients who are uncooperative or mental retarded, we can use general anesthesia. Local anesthesia is in form of peribulbar anesthesia or retrobulbar with facial blocks. The incision can be a scleral incision, as in this case, a limbal incision in case of limbal sutures, and a clear causal incision in case of phaco emulsification. Capsulotomy is essentially a can opener capsulotomy, as in case of an ECC. Although you can practice a curvilinear capsulorexis in all the cases, a curvilinear capsulorexis also called as the CCC or continuous curvilinear capsular axis involves making a circular opening in the anterior lens capsule as seen in this particular diagram here you can see a circular opening in the anterior lens capsule and implantation of an intraocular lens in the capsular bag this is supposed to be the ideal outcome after a cataract surgery the hydrodissection is the next step once the capsular opening a circular opening is achieved then there is a fluid wave that is injected with the help of a cannula under the capsular opening and there is a fluid wave that is generated. The fluid wave dissects or cleaves in between the cortex and the capsule. This particular fluid wave is called as the hydrodissection. Hydrodissection achieves the separation of the adhesions in between the cortex and the capsule and helps in mobility of the nucleus inside the capsular bag. Hydrodelineation, however, reduces the size of the endonucleus by injecting in between the cortex and the nucleus, that is to delineate the endonucleus. This will help removing the nucleus through a smaller incision as in case of manual surgery or helps target the lens in case of a phaco emulsification. Nucleus removal, the different techniques are the prolapse of the nucleus as a whole from the capsular bag done in case of a conventional surgery where the entire lens is removed. We can do an entire in total removal of the lens in SICS or you can proceed to a manual phaco section with various instruments or in case of a phaco emulsifier where there is no segment that is removed but it is a pure emulsion by use of ultrasound energy. So there is no intact nucleus or nucleus element that comes out of the eye and this is managed through a very small section by making them into very small pieces. This is followed by once the endonucleus is removed in this way, we are left with the cortex that is the part of the lens surrounding the endonucleus and this is removed by what we call as irrigation and aspiration. This aspiration and cortical cleaning is followed by cleaning and polishing of the capsular bag and implantation of an intraocular lens. The types of intraocular lenses can be classified as follows in terms of method of implantation, rigid and foldable lens. Foldable lenses can enter through a very small incision whereas rigid lenses require at least a 5 mm incision to be introduced inside the eye. By material, they can be classified as PMMA lenses, that is polymethyl methacrylate. Hy acrylic lenses in terms of hydrophobic and hydrophilic, that form the foldable variety. And silicone lenses, those also form the foldable variety. The hydrophobic acrylic is the index material having the best results in most of the eyes as on today. By design, the single piece and multi piece are the two types of lenses, out of which the PMMA and the hydrophilic acrylic lenses are single piece whereas the hydrophobic lenses come in a single as well as a multi-piece. In terms of the site of implantation, this particular lens can be implanted considering this to be the iris and this to be the cornea. It can be implanted in the anterior chamber. It can be implanted clipping the iris. It can be implanted in the posterior chamber or it can be implanted in the capsular bag. The basic advantage of in the bag implantation is that it is as near the nodal point as possible and it is the most physiological that no part of the lens will touch any part of the uveal tissue. Hence it is uh, induces the least reaction and the least problems after cataract surgery. Complications of cataract surgery are divided into intra and post-operative complications. 
The most notable of the intraoperative complications include a posterior capsular rupture and the drop of a nucleus fragment. The posterior capsular rupture can be associated with vitreous loss or there may not be any vitreous loss. The treatment and the management will depend upon the degree and the amount of vitreous loss and the posterior capsular rupture. Drop nucleus fragment however needs urgent referral to the retina surgeon to do a complete vitrectomy and remove the fragment. Postoperatively, the main complication of any uncomplicated cataract surgery is cystoid macular edema or it is also called as the Irvine gas syndrome in which there is leakage from the macular capillaries and thickening of the fovea leading to a decrease in the best corrected visual acuity. It is a common place to find angiographic changes of macular edema after most of the cataract surgeries. However, they do not translate into clinical cystoid macular edema. The most disastrous complication of all postoperatively is infectious endophthalmitis. As the name suggests, it is the infection of the inner layers of the retina and the vitreous, essentially an abscess inside the eye. Acute infection with pseudomonas has the worst prognosis, although infection with other organisms like Staph epidermidis relatively have a better course. Prophylaxis of endophthalmitis is extremely important and two steps that have stood the control trials and the test of time are preoperative installation of betadine in the conjunctival cul-de-sac and intracameral antibiotics at the end of surgery according to the recent trial in Europe. The treatment of the endophthalmitis is a painstaking process. It depends on the degree, the severity of the endophthalmitis and the visual acuity at the time of presentation. If the visual acuity is reduced to less than hand moments, vitrectomy with intravitreal antibiotics is the first resort. In case the visual acuity is better than that, intravitreal injections can be once, given once and repeated and the patient monitored closely for improvement. In case of worsening, the patient may proceed for a core vitrectomy with intravitreal antibiotics. One important aspect of endophthalmitis is chronic endophthalmitis occurring due to a low-grade organism which is a commensal of the lids called as the propionibacterium species. This kind of propionibacterium endophthalmitis is a slow low-grade uveitis which can present months after surgery and is exquisitely responsive to steroids. But the inflammation in the eye will recur the moment steroids are stopped. Intravitreal injection of antibiotics, intracapsular injection of antibiotics or intraocular lens explantation may be required in these cases to treat them. One very common complication or maybe a sequelae to cataract surgery is posterior capsular opacification or a PCO. As seen in the next slide, the picture on the left hand side down, it shows a hazy or a white flake like material on the posterior lens capsule that is called as a posterior capsular opacification or after cataract. This is nothing but proliferation of residual lens epithelial cells on the posterior capsule and these can cause decrease in vision a few months or a few years after cataract surgery. The treatment of that is ND eye laser capsulotomy as you can see in the other photograph of the same patient. We have used a laser without causing damage or without entering the eye. We have opened up the capsule by focusing laser energy and causing a gap and then the patient's vision improves. The chance of developing a posterior capsular opacification is the least in hydrophobic intraocular lenses with in the bag implantation as shown above in this picture. The other lenses or the single piece PMMA lenses implanted in the sulcus are as follows here where you actually do not see any capsular cover like this and these haptics are located just behind the iris within the ciliary sulcus. In this case is, uh, is of an iris fixated intraocular lens where here you can see the enclavations of the iris and the ovalization of the pupil where the lens pinches the iris stroma. On dilatation however the pupil dilates circular and here you can see the claws of the lens. So these lenses are not a primary choice of implantation but can be done in terms of complications with good results. With the advent of modern technology, the incision size in cataract surgery has reduced. All the other steps remaining the same. The improved visual outcome on day one post surgery and quiet eyes with sparing of the conjunctiva are the order of the day. Reducing incision sizes and increasing the precision using femtosecond 
लेजर कैट्रैक्ट सर्जरी अपियर्स टू बी अ ट्रेंड इन द फ्यूचर